I would like our committee members to stand and identify yourselves. Please. Come on up here. Ed. He's eating right now. Turn this way. Come on up. Iceland. Vernon, where you are, Vernon? Up here, please. Committee members over here. Yeah, I want you. So this is something that I've thought about. I've traveled the trails to come over here, live in the other mountain range. I'm, I'm Ed Galindo from the University of Idaho. The Yaki Native has spent many years with Shoshone Bannock tribe. I have great respect for that tribe. 20 some years through science chairman. Still yet, I have students that have, that have went to here, Sage Kootenai, that are all over the place, and that came from various tribes in Montana. And I was honored to teach them. But I want to I wanna give some gifts away, as we do as Indian people, to respect the good work that has been done. The very first gift are to our PhD students. And there's many more out there, I know, but I know these two characters the best. So they get the first two gifts. So my sister made, made these. And one will go to Heisen here. And one will go to Vernon. And so those, when they become more fancy than they are now, and they have their fancy name tags, they go to conferences, they remember who they are. You know? That's what those are for. And I know they won't forget. This next one, I want, I, want to rem I want you to remember this story I'm about to do. These here are some of my friends from the Coeur d'Alene Reservation. Now, there's a story about what's going to happen here. So you watch. Teaching moment. I've only seen one moccasin another time. Teepee creepy, but that's another story. We won't, we won't get into that right now. You know, not that I did that, of course, but we won't, we won't get into that. But our chairman gets one. And you get one. You get one. And you get one. Now, here's a story. What good is one moccasin? Again, if we're teepee creeping, that's another story. But we won't go there. <laughs> One moccasin's not much good. It's when you come together, they become a pair. That's when you can do the best. And so our committee, I want them to remember that at this place. When they come together, and they come together for students, good things can happen. By one, it's good to look at, but it's not much good, you know? It's all, only when you come together. You each have a different one. When you come together, you have a pair. It's up to you to do that. So that's the gift I give to you. And as Indian people, that's something that we do. It's as common as anything. That's my gift to uh, give to the people here. So thank you. You can all sit down now. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, oh, I have a statement I need to read from the Equal Opportunity Office. Here we go. The university extends a sincere welcome to the candidate. We hope that you find our community hospitable. The open forum is an opportunity for you to address the topics the search committee has asked you to address. It is also an opportunity for interested members of the community to ask you questions about your candidacy for this position. Audience members will have the opportunity to provide feedback to the search committee by way of a forum containing questions about their assessment for your qualification for this position. Thank you also to the folks who have taken the time to attend this open forum. This is an important position for the University of Montana. Your involvement is important. 
please remember that all searches, including this search, are governed by university equal opportunity policies. Discrimination based on race, color, religion, natural origin, creed, service in the military, political ideas, sexual orientation, sex, age, marital or family status, or disability is prohibited. As such, it's generally not acceptable to ask questions which require candidates to disclose personal information about these protected categories. If, as facilitator of this forum, I find a question to be inappropriate, I'll ask the candidate to not respond and give the audience member opportunity to rephrase the question. This is not meant to embarrass anyone, but simply to ensure that we follow the required policies and laws as proceeded with the search. As a logistical manner, we ask the audience members uh, not record this session with any visual or audio recording devices. And I've asked Ron every time to be respectful of prayer, and he has every single time. So thank you for that. You've been given a green sheet. If you don't have a green sheet, there will be one provided for you right up here. And this is ironic. There's green pins that go with this. So anyway, they're up here as well. Um, let me talk a little bit about the filming and the chair. Ed, the chair, can correct me if I'm wrong. We will finish, conclude tonight. Uh, I think Ron will get it to the provost by Wednesday. And then within 24 hours, it should be posted on the provost's webpage. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's the general scheme as we best understand things. Okay, so that's what we'll be looking for, just in case you're curious. Uh, yeah, any questions so far? All right, now I'm, I'm famous over here for a lot of things. You've heard of Famous Dave's? This isn't that, this is Famous Ed. So, I'm going to loosen you up with some stim jokes. Yeah, you know, I've, I've thought about them on the trail. This circle reminded me of one. So a female circle takes an ocean ride. What does she see? Hang on your hats. Pie rights. You know, pie rights because it's a pie. <laughs> this is a rough crowd here. Well, okay, hang on, I'm gonna loosen them up, you know, just get your shoulders, get your shoulders into it. Here we go, here we go. So bacterium. Bacterium decides to go to the stock market. I read about that in the newspaper. So anyway, Stockman. It wants to order a pizza. And the proprietor says, I can't do it. And the bacterium says, why not? And he says, because I don't have the staff. You know, S-T-A-P-H. <laughs> one last one. Hold me back. Hold me back. Hold me back. <laughs> this is a genetics one. This is, this is for Bull right here. So, these silly scientists, they want to cross a monkey with a flower. Guess what they come up with? Here we go. A chimpanzee. Aww. You know, chimpanzee? <laughs> hey, I'm only here till Wednesday. That's right. So, don't, don't worry. You know, come back. Come back. Come back. All right. Bull, I think I got him in a frenzy. I can see. They're all loosened up and ready to go. So, all right. It it uh, serves me as great honor to introduce Dr. Bull Bennett. I knew Bull when his just got his PhD is brand spanking new. You know how a new car smells? You open it up. That's how it smelt. Man, that thing was just shiny and new and woo, man, it was really good. And we presented at a place. Uh, Johnson, is it Johnson Hotel, Bull? Alex Johnson's. What is it? Alex Johnson. Alex Johnson. And I found out later it's a haunted place. It's an old, old place in the Dakotas. But the funniest story of all about this, I never told Bull this story all these years, is I took a tribal vehicle over there, you know, with government tags, and I parked it right in front of this place. And I left it there for three days, and I got 15 tickets. But a government tag, who are they going to, you know, tag that to? And to this day, I took all them tickets in the glove box, you know, never. I just thought, well, it's all right. You know, I wasn't parking in a handicapped place. But I figured, yeah, go ahead, try to get this from the government, see what happens. You know, then you can see how we all are. So anyway, that's my sidebar story for Bull. 
know, he probably had to pay for it, I don't know. But anyway, anyway. Um, it's great pleasure to introduce Paul. He's not going to do a slideshow tonight. He's going to have a conversation. And that's what he wanted to do as a circular room was his request as well. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bull Bennett, and he can tell us his story. Take it away, Bull. Helmetaki <clears throat> api. Nila kasukwe teo. My name is, uh, uh, my Mi'kmaq name is Angry Bull Moose. And I was named by my father when I was very young. And perhaps he saw something that no one knew at the time that I would be this big. Um, my father was Alden Bennett. Uh, he was Mi'kmaq Indian, uh, born and raised in Maine. His father before him uh, <clears throat> came from uh, uh, Shubenacadie, uh, Nova Scotia. And his father before him came from uh, Yarmouth, the Acadia Band of Mi'kmaq. I'm sorry, I'm getting some requests. Okay. <clears throat> and his father bef uh, before him came from uh, Yarmouth area, Arcadia, Nova Scotia. So I'm Mi'kmaq Indian. My mother was uh, Sicilian. Her uh, grandparents immigrated from Sicily. Uh, so my mother was third generation Sicilian that came via uh, Ellis Island. <clears throat> so uh, as Ed indicated, you know, I did request a circle because uh, from my perspective, uh, we're family. And uh, um, family does not stand up and preach, well maybe they do, <laughs> but they don't stand up and, and talk at each other, but it's, instead we share. And so that is the, the way that I was taught, and that was the way that I wanted to proceed with this discussion. In regards to whether or not I've, uh, you know, the, my new smell, uh, Ed, my wife will contest that I've smelled like a lot of things, and a new car has never been one of them. <laughs> So I'm really happy to see a lot of uh, familiar faces, a lot of friends, and a lot of family who I've gotten to know over the years, uh, people that I've grown to respect and admire, uh, colleagues, friends, brothers and sisters. And so it is a, a truly a blessing for me to, to come here and uh, to share this time with you guys. Um, for those who saw me earlier today, you saw me in my tie. Uh, I have a story uh, um, regarding why I'm not wearing my tie now. And uh, one of my good friends, his name is Doug Cluck. Uh, unfortunate name, great guy, unfortunate name. Uh, and he uh, works for the NOAA uh, Climate Services Center based out of Kansas City. And this last fall, we had a, a meeting with uh, the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Association over in uh, Bismarck as part of the Intertribal Summit. And uh, so Doug shows up in a suit wearing a tie, and he's the only one in the room. And so I had to say, Doug, you know, you look like your FBI. So the next time you do this, you, you don't wear a tie. You know, again, we're family and this is informal. And I wanted to give an opportunity for, for this audience, um, you know, my family here, to get to know me and who I am and where I come from, um, the direction in which I'm heading. I know that there, uh, there's some good questions that, um, uh, that we can have a chance to explore together uh, regarding the nature of the gnarl position and the future in which it has in store for the students and for this campus and for Indian country. And so um, <clears throat> we'll have a chance to talk about all of that. Um, so I want to explain how I kind of got to this point. Um, I was born in Maine and uh, uh, at some point in the younger part of my life my family moved to Southern California. And so from the time I was a baby until I was about three, three and a half, four years old, I lived in West Covina, California. And uh, I remember early on that my dad was always very transient. He'd come and he would go. And sometimes he would be gone for a day. Sometimes it would be a week. Sometimes it would be a month, a couple months. And then there was one time he was gone for over a year. And I remember I came home uh, I was with, playing with my friend, and I came home, and I saw a two-ton GMC stock truck sitting in the driveway, and had Wyoming plates on it. And I was like, whoa, look at the bucking horse. I was really mesmerized by that. And so I walk in the house, and there's my dad. And I remember feeling that, 
that exhilaration, that little kid, is just pure, unadulterated love for seeing your father that you haven't seen in a long time. And so I was like, Dad, and I embraced him. And his words to me were, was, pack your things, son, we're heading to Wyoming. And I said, well, what's Wyoming? And uh, over the course of the next few days, I remember I had to take everything that I owned and put it in a pile. And I was able to select three things. And that's what I could take with me. Three of my favorite toys, that was it. Everything else I had to leave behind. And I remember weeping, because these were things that were most important to me when I was that age. And for the next four and a half days, the top speed on that GMC was about 34 miles an hour. And so for the next four days, we made our way from West Covina, California, to Gas Hills, Wyoming. <clears throat> and my dad had uh, run out of money on his way to Alaska, and uh, a very talented machinist and a welder and a mechanic, and went to work for Lucky Mac Uranium Mine, just off the Wind River Reservation. And so um, my introduction to the West was uh, living in a mining camp in Gas Hills. If you ever go out there, the only thing that is evident of a community there is there's one tree that sits out there and it just does not belong. Otherwise, it just looks like restored prairie. <clears throat> so, so I spent the first six years in Wyoming living in Gas Hills. And back then, um, the only source of entertainment we had was our horses. And uh, so oftentimes, it, we free ranged them. We didn't have a corral or anything. And uh, <clears throat> so we, when it came time to ride, we'd uh, spot them with the binoculars and then we would drive to generally where they were. And then my dad would get out with a grain bucket and he would shake it. And those horses, they knew, they were conditioned, they knew to come when that grain, went, that grain bucket was shook. So they would come in and uh, we would saddle up and we would ride. And so I grew up uh, in an area where there wasn't much for cross fences. Um, our entertainment was our horses and whatever other trouble we could get into. And, Oftentimes it caused my mom much grief. It's a wonder she ever let us leave the house, as much trouble as we got into. Um, and so I, I remember fondly taking two-day rides up, rides up into the Rattlesnake Mountains to go fishing on horseback. We'd pack a couple of Wonder Bread loaf of uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and just go camp for a couple of days and fish. And we would eat what we caught. And that's what my first experiences in the West were. And uh, I, I thought I was in heaven. And then my dad ultimately, the mine was shutting down and um, my dad, always a transient, um, it was time to move on. So we ended up over in Casper, Wyoming, about 20 miles north. And what was interesting is uh, we were so poor, we really couldn't afford to drop a well, uh, nor could we afford electricity. And so uh, I lived in a, a single wide trailer about 25 miles north of Casper, out in the middle of sagebrush. And, uh, um, I remember doing uh, my homework, you know, through my uh, grade school and middle school years. I remember doing homework by candlelight or by kerosene lamp. And <clears throat> I also remember those brutally cold winters in central Wyoming. And there was no windbreak. It was, and I remember waking up, and if you were a smart kid, you would go and lay your clothes out by the, by the stove uh, before you went to bed. Because in the morning, there'd be a quarter inch of frost, and it would be below zero in your room. And so you had to convince yourself, you know, build yourself up to, to jump out of bed and sprint into the other room to get dressed. And uh, again, that was normal for me. That was part of who I was. And uh, I remember the treats being able to go into town and take a shower instead of heating water on the stove and taking a bath. And, <clears throat> but that was normal to me. I didn't understand anything else. That's all I knew. <clears throat> And eventually, uh, we moved into town, and uh, I started using water uh, to bathe, and <laughs> uh, discovered the wonders of electricity, and then MTV, and the rest is history. So <clears throat> as a young man, <clears throat> culture was not something that was very popular in our house. My dad refused to talk about it. Uh, my mom knew nothing about it. Um, but although we didn't talk about culture in our house, what we did was practice culture outside our house. And so from the time I was a little guy, when it was 
whether we were fishing or we were hunting or we were out on horseback. And my dad was always showing me things and he was always teaching me these things. And as a little, as a young man, never appreciated those things that he had to, to teach me because I was, you know, I was young, I was immature. I wasn't ready for those kinds of lessons. And, <clears throat> and as I've had a chance, you know, my dad has since passed a number of years ago and I've had a chance to reflect on my life and my time with him. And uh, in spite of all of his faults, he instilled in me uh, those cultural principles that make me who I am now. Um, being able to walk in balance with the, and, and understanding that connection that I have to the earth. And I remember we would go hunting and he would always tell me, he says, the worst part of hunting is squeezing the trigger. He says, because once you squeeze that trigger, you can't call that bullet back. And that animal whose life you just took, he lived his entire life for that moment that you took it. And so you always be respectful. And so these were kind of the things that my father taught me. You never take more than I needed to always treat your horses well because they will take care of you if you take good care of them. Um, and th so these were the things that, although we didn't talk about our ceremonies, I did not grow up with my language, uh, but there were still cultural underpinnings that were instilled in me as a very young man or a young boy that have carried me through today. <clears throat> So, um, you know, I, I, I sit here before you today not as Dr. Bennett um, because we're family and family don't address each other that way. Um, my Mi'kmaq name is Kasakwe Te'a, which, as I said, uh, means angry bull moose, and that's where the name bull comes from. My mother named me Timothy, my father named me Bull. And so, uh, those who know me know me as Tim or really as Timmy when I was a little guy. Uh, but uh, I haven't been called Timmy in quite, some long, quite a long time, I had some no ideas. <clears throat> so uh, that's kind of where I come from. Um, I grew up very humbly, but uh, um, I'm the youngest of eight kids. I have uh, four, older brother, or four older sisters and three older brothers. And um, so oftentimes they say that I'm the, the spoiled baby, um, but sometimes I wonder if that was the case. I think my mom and dad exhausted themselves on my older siblings. <clears throat> and so when I came rolling around, it was uh, like, eh, just as long as you're not killing yourself or destroying something, then we don't want to hear about it. <clears throat> so um, it wasn't until I got into high school that uh, I started learning things about my family and about where we came from. And I would talk to my oldest brother because he knew. And uh, my oldest brother lived a long way away, so I didn't get the chance to see or talk to him much. We would write letters. And if I could sit down long enough as a high school student to actually write a letter, then I would, which was about once every three months. Uh, but I began slowly to learn about who I was and where my family had come from. And um, uh, that was, for me, that was when class was in session. <clears throat> And the knowledge that was passed on to me by my dad, by my older brother, um, started me on this journey of really exploring who I was. And it really came to a head probably at the end of high school when I started college and I really started digging deep into who I was as a cultural person. <clears throat> and some of the toughest decisions that I made personally at that age was to walk away from Catholicism and Christianity and to um, begin exploring that other paradigm, that other way of knowing, of uh, um, being part of that, that spirit element, that um, the other part of who we are, not just physical beings, but spiritual beings as well. <clears throat> and so I've always considered that time as my training ground, as um, a time for me to learn about who I was and uh, to make mistakes, and I made plenty of them, um, and learning about what it truly meant to walk in that red path. It hasn't been an easy journey by any means. Uh, it's been very, very difficult. Um, but that's who I am. So um, 
as I began to understand who I was as a cultural person, then um, it came time for me to, to also consider you know, giving back, not just to my family, but to, to my greater family, my extended family. And uh, so I had some decisions to make. Um, <clears throat> I rebelled for a while. I got drunk for about four years. I dropped out of college twice and uh, really spun for a while. And then uh, in 1992, um, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. This is her second go around with that. <clears throat> and it, came, it was, came on very, very aggressively. And she was diagnosed in September and she had passed by April. That's how fast it came on. And, and it was, it was terminal from the, from the onset. So I had a very short time to hang with my mom before she passed. And at the time I was unemployed, I was drunk most of the time. And uh, so my mom, or, yeah, my mom was living in my sister's basement and uh, she was on a 24 hour watch. And uh, my sister, she you know, worked really hard to take care of my mom, but she couldn't do it by herself. And so I volunteered to take the graveyard shifts because my mom was in so much pain, she just had stopped sleeping because the pain wouldn't allow her to sleep. And so those were times that I got to spend with just me and her and uh, to learn about who she was as a person and also to learn about who I was too. And uh, there was one particular night and it was very late. I don't remember what time it was. Um, and during that time I would read to her or we would talk and sometimes we'd just sit in silence. And uh, it was one of those silent moments and she, she used to call me kid. And she'd say, kid, I need you to do me a, I need you to make me a promise. And I said, yeah, sure, mom. She goes, I want you to go back to school and I want you to do something with your life. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. She says, no, don't dismiss me. You go back to school and you go do something with your life. I'm like, yeah, okay. She's like, no, you promise me now that this is what you're going to do. And uh, so I did, I promised her that that's what I would do. So uh, over the next couple of days, I packed up what little I had was mo mostly my clothes and my guns and uh, contacted a friend and hitched a ride up to Spearfish and went back to school. And when I got there, because I showed up late in the semester, I wasn't allowed to enter school because the semester had already started. And so um, I didn't have a job, I didn't have a place to live. I just had my bag of clothes and my guns and that was it. <clears throat> and so I ended up sleeping on a couple people's couches and some floors and whatnot. And uh, I remember I spent, I had like 90, no, I had $100 in my pocket. That was all the money I had. And I spent 92 of it to put down for one month deposit on a low income apartment in Spearfish, which left me $8. Uh, and I was happy I had a roof over my head for a month. No furniture, just my clothes. You know, I had no blankets, no furniture, nothing. It was just me in this apartment. And uh, so I went, after I did that, I was very proud of myself. And uh, I walked over to Walmart and with my $8, I got a couple cans of potted meat product, a box of crackers, a box of Little Debbie's. And that was pretty much all the money I had. So for the next three or four days, I ate crackers and potted meat product and, and Little Debbie's. And it reached that point where I started getting hungry and I was looking at my guns and it's like, you know what, hunting season or no, I'm gonna go eat something. <laughs> and so this guy, you know, swung by and says, you know, I'm on my way to Deadwood. Uh, you wanna hop in and go for a ride? I said, sure. So I rode up with him to Deadwood and we ended up walking into saloon number 10. If you guys have ever been to Deadwood and uh, know the history of saloon number 10, that was a place where Wild Bill Hickok was, was killed. A uh, very famous or infamous place in Deadwood. And I walked in and asked them, you know, do you guys need a bouncer? And they looked at me and said, absolutely. <laughs> so I was like, okay, can you guys front me a week's worth of pay? <laughs> I promise I'll be back. And they said, sure. So they fronted me some money. And I was able to buy some groceries. And that's where it started. <clears throat> so um, 
I dabbled in football, college football. I played for the University of Wyoming, got the hell pounded out of me. Thought I'd, I'd try a smaller college at Black Hill State. Got the hell pounded out of me. And uh, before my mom had passed, she's like, you're not fulfilling your promise to me. I didn't send you back to school to play football. I sent you back to school to do something with your life. And so I ended up quitting football. And, but it was before I quit, I, was, uh, I had a knee surgery when I was in high school from playing football. And I was trying to get cleared by the doctor so I could play. And I was reading an article at the doctor's office and it was uh, about uh, black bear poaching and how bears were being poached for their gall bladders because they would be dried and ground and used as an aphrodisiac in uh, Asian black markets. And they were quantifying the number of bears that were being killed per year. And I was outraged. It really struck home to me. And it brought me back to that time when I was a little kid and my dad would teach me about never take more than you can use. You always be respectful. And at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. <clears throat> uh, didn't know what I wanted to study. But then it finally dawned on me that uh, um, I had to go back and do what I know, and that was wildlife, it was fisheries, it was being part of the land. And that, the next day, I walked away from football, and I went to, uh, down to the registrar's office. I changed my major for the fourth and final time to biology and decided I was going to be a wildlife ecologist. And so I walked away from football, I got serious about school, and over the next three years, I worked really, really hard to um, finish my bachelor's degree. And uh, so during that time, there was a couple of key things that, that happened for me. Besides that, the, one of the, the thing that drove me was that commitment I made to my mom, that promise. And she passed in April of that year. And, and uh, later on that fall, my wife and I got married. And uh, my wife didn't want me in the bar anymore. And I don't blame her. <clears throat> so uh, I was offered a job uh, to go and make snow up at Terry Peak in the Black Hills. And so I became a snowmaker for the next three winters. But that meant I didn't have a job during the summer. And so somebody had uh, driven me up to Rapid City. And uh, I ended up on School Mines campus at the uh, Ro uh, Rocky Mountain Forest and Range Experiment Station. That was run by uh, Dan Uresk, was a project leader. And he was a rangeland scientist. And I went in and I introduced myself and told him I was a student and we visited for a while and he's like, you know what, I want to offer you an internship. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, come and work for me for the summer. And uh, I was pretty excited about it because I wanted to be a biologist and uh, now I have an opportunity to do just that. So that became my very first internship. And I spent the summer back in Wyoming in Thunder Basin grasslands. Um, looking at the cereal stages of greasewood and um, riparian habitats in the uh, uh, Powder River Basin, primarily on the Thunder Basin grasslands. And that was my first exposure to research, and I was hooked. The next summer, I, well, that winter I made snow again, then the following summer, Dan, I called Dan and said, I'm ready to come back to work. He's like, okay, we're going to start this day. You come in, and I ended up on uh, Wind Cave National Park uh, looking at uh, um, invasion rates of exotic species on prescribed burn areas in Wind Cave. <clears throat> so uh, I was in my element. I was in my groove. And so that next summer rolled around and I went to Dan again and said, Dan, I'm ready to come back to work. And he's like, well, I can't do it. He says, but I want you to call this person at EPA down in Pine Ridge. They're looking for somebody to come down there. And so that job turned into an intern biologist working with the uh, Oglala Sioux Tribe as a in their natural resource program. And so my job was to cruise the entire reservation looking for abandoned underground storage tanks. Uh, so me and Tony Brewer had a pretty wild time looking for old tanks. And uh, interesting thing before I leave that story is there are a number, and I was surprised at the number of uh, petroleum tanks that are underground on Pine Ridge. And uh, I was also surprised at the number of those tanks that were leaking product into the soil. Furthermore, I was surprised that 80% of them belonged to the BIA. And at the time, I was an intern for the EPA. And EPA was very stringent on contamination. And so for those 
uh, people that had, that were non-government, but tribal people who had storage tanks on their land, they would be charged $25,000 per day for each day they were out of compliance after a particular period of time. So the responsibility was on them to front the money to dig up these tanks, to pull these tanks out, pull all the contaminated soil out and bioremediate it, working with the tribe to bioremediate that soil. <clears throat> and so I remember like saying, well, why don't we go after the BIA for this? And they laughed at me and they said, one federal agency cannot tell another federal agency what to do. So you mean to tell me that we're out here picking on the little guy and the biggest violator is the, the federal government itself? And like, yeah, that's right, welcome to Indian country. So that was uh, another dose of reality. So Dan Urasko was very instrumental because he opened the, the door for research and science in a very applied way, in a very meaningful way. <clears throat> when I finished my bachelor's, I hadn't even really thought about graduate school, but uh, uh, my wife, she's always looking out for me. She went out and uh, requested a number of different applications from all these different graduate schools from around the country. And so she would fill them out and she'd hand them, sign your name here, sign your name here, answer me this question, she'd write it down, now sign your name here. So I filled out about a half a dozen or more applications for grad school. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, you're going to grad school. I'm like, no, I'm not. She's like, yes, you are. And so um, one of the scientists in the uh, research station in Rapid City, uh, Mark Rumble, uh, he's an alumni from the University of Wyoming, and his advisor was Stan Anderson. And uh, I didn't know Stan from anybody. And Mark's like, you know what, just if you get a chance, call a man, I have a conversation with him. So I did, I called Stan Anderson. Hello Stan, my name's Bill Bennett, I'm gonna be a graduate of Black Hill State. And uh, so Stan invited me to come down and visit him. And uh, so that, I remember that spring of 96, I, <laughs> 85 S10 Blazer, complete res rocket, rust, windows that didn't work, door handles were missing, and I drove down in a blizzard from Spearfish down to Laramie just to have a half an hour face-to-face -face conversation with Stan Anderson, because that's what you do. That's how I was taught, that you don't just talk to people on the phone. When you talk with them, you look them in the eye and you tell them who you are. And so I did. I, what money I had, I went down to Laramie and for that half an hour discussion actually turned into about an hour and a half. And then Stan took me down to the basement of the Biological Sciences Building at the University of Wyoming. And he introduced me to a number of grad students. And then he introduced me to the research assistants that were working there. And they're talking about the kind of research that they have going on. And, and uh, Stan, and I didn't know it at the time, but Stan was a pretty renowned um, biologist or ecologist. Um, and his bailiwick was primarily birds, non-predatory birds. And it was not uncommon for Stan to get a phone call from somebody in New Zealand. Dr. Anderson, we have a rare bird down here that's, and we want you to come down and take a look at it. And Stan would hop a plane and fly to New Zealand to go and investigate this bird. He had that kind of pull. And I didn't realize who he was. And uh, uh, eventually I was accepted to grad school. And, um, one day, Lauren Ayers, one of the research assistants, comes up to me, we're talking, having coffee or something, and he says, Bull, he says, you don't get it, do you? And I was like, get what, Lauren? He's like, you don't understand why you're here. I'm like, um, okay, we'll explain. And he says, do you realize that when you applied here to the co-op unit, that you were one of 600 graduates, or 600 applicants that Stan was considering, one of 600. He says, you ever think about why he selected you? It's like, well, Lauren, first of all, I didn't know who the competition was. I just thought Dan wanted to hire, or Stan wanted to hire me. He's like, no, uh, he did. He says, uh, um, what sets you apart is your willingness to drive in a blizzard to come down for a half an hour conversation. Um, and he says, uh, you weren't anything special coming out of Black Hill State with a 3.1 GPA. He says, but what that told Stan was that you weren't afraid to fail and you knew how to fail. And that's what he was looking for you know, as a grad student. <clears throat> and so um, Stan Anderson, and uh, he passed a few years ago, but uh, 
he was another one who was pivotal in my life that took a chance on me when really he had no business doing it. But he did. He took a chance. And so um, I finished my master's. And uh, I remember I was still in the basement. I was still working on my master's work in the basement. We never got any sunlight unless it was piped in. And a friend of mine who had been up on Shine River says, you know, I know this guy. And I was just in his office, and he has this big picture of a black-footed ferret on his wall. And those of you guys who saw my talk today, my master's thesis was on black-footed ferrets. And so he said, well, you need to call him up. So I did. And uh, the person was Jim Garrett. And he, at the time, he was a uh, vice president um, at uh, what was then known as Shine River Community College. And uh, so that conversation was lasted about two and a half hours. Jim and I couldn't get enough of each other. And so it set into motion that as soon as I graduated, he was going to hire me at Shine River, and together we were going to build this natural resource program at the tribal college. We were going to be uh, partnered with uh, Te Chaka, the tribal buffalo program there on Shine River. Uh, we're going to be rolling out internships for students to work on grassland ecology, all the stuff that hit me right where I lived. And that's where I wanted to go. <clears throat> so when it came time for me to graduate, well, I did, um, and I called Jim. I said, Jim, I'm ready to come up. And he said, I don't have the money for you, Bull. So I ended up taking a job back on Pine Ridge, uh, working at OLC as a science coordinator for the Rural Systemic Initiative. And uh, I was very, very green um, at tribal colleges. Still didn't understand where I was. Um, I was there for a year. And then Jim came through and said, Bull, I've got the money. I want you to come up. And so um, I left OLC right at the time that Jim left Cheyenne River Community College, which had then changed its name to Setonka College, named after Chief Bigfoot. A mini Koji Lakota that was killed and wounded me. <clears throat> and uh, so I ended up at Shine River, and when I showed up on the scene, they handed me all of Jim's programs. And uh, it's like, wow, that was quite a responsibility. So I had six uh, extension programs I was in charge of, plus I had a uh, science and natural resource department to build, plus I had three biology classes and an ecology class I had to teach. And I still had to go out and find some math instructors to cover the math. So welcome to the world of tribal colleges, right? <clears throat> so um, anyway, Jim coached me along through that time because those programs, he, you know, those were his babies. And I felt like it was my responsibility to rock those babies the best that I could. And uh, it was during that time that's when the the realities of tribal colleges struck with me. And I probably saw the worst in people during my time there. And I'm not saying this to reflect poorly on the Mini Koji Lakota, but there were individuals at that college that did things that flew in the face of everything I knew as a tribal person. I saw students that dropped out of class because they couldn't afford to come to my class anymore. They couldn't afford the gas money. It's like, what do you mean? You're on a MIE scholarship. They could pay for your gas. They pay for your books. They pay you a stipend to be in my class. Where are you? They took my scholarship away. Why? You're a 3.8 student. No, they, I don't know why. They just said they're no longer doing scholarships. And then you go and you track it down. You find out that uh, uh, one of the vice presidents had a relative that needed a car. And so they took all the MIE scholarships out of the budget, dismantled that, and went and purchased a vehicle for somebody. Or somebody needed a computer. You know, and, you, and so I saw things that just was so outrageous. And, but I wasn't from Cheyenne River. I had no voice. And uh, <clears throat> that was a huge learning curve for me. And so at that time, I saw the worst of what I felt was the worst of Indian country. <clears throat> but still, I held on to that wasn't the entire picture of who we are as indigenous people. Those were some very poor people, um, poor in ethics. And, uh, but that disappointment and that anger and that hurt and that bitter feeling that I, that I felt, that never again will I ever find myself in that situation. Never again will I put myself in a position where I will witness my students suffer the way that they did or witness a college that would implode on itself under the weight of of corruption 
And uh, so I left. I left Cheyenne River. I actually, I forced them to fire me. <clears throat> and they did, happily. And uh, it was when I was at OLC, the um, previous years, that uh, um, I had a chance to work with School Minds in Rapid City to uh, um, build an outdoor classroom outside of Olala, Loman Housing on Pine Ridge. And I was working with Leonard Littlefinger and um, got to know Sherry Farwell, Pat Zimmerman, Doug McTaggart, who are scientists. And uh, Sherry was the Dean of Graduate Studies at School Minds. And during that time, they like, they asked me, Bull, how come you don't have your PhD? I was like, I'm a, I work at a tribal college, who has the time? And they said, well, if you ever reach that point, consider school minds. And I was like, okay. So I dismissed it, didn't think about it. And then after I left uh, Sitanka, um, I called them up and I said, were you guys serious or are you guys just jerking my chain? They're like, no, we're serious, we want you here. And uh, so I said, okay, you send me some gas money and I'll come down from Shine River, I'll go to Rapid City and let's talk about it. And that's when I started my doctorate program. So um, during that time, you know, I thought I would never ever work for tribal colleges again, but it was when I was involved in my graduate research and then I, I was talking uh, with Iceland over dinner tonight. And there came a point because I was still reeling from that nastiness that I saw there. And I was still battling between what that was and then what I knew was cultural principles, was tri truly tribal principles, and they weren't the same. And I knew that I had to make a decision. And I remember we were living in this, renting this little house in Rapid, North Rapid City at the time, this, and uh, this house was probably maybe as big as this circle at best, this tiny little house. And I went in to take a shower, and I was just battling with myself and I sat down on the floor in the bathroom and I just started sobbing. So my wife comes in and is like, well, what's the matter? And I told her, I said, I have to make a decision. I have to make a commitment and I don't know if I'm ready to do it. And she goes, well, what is that? I said, I have to decide if I'm going to, if I am going to give back to my people or walk away from them forever. And so I had to make that decision and that day, I made a commitment to myself, much like I made the commitment to my mom, that the knowledge and the opportunities that were given to me did not belong to me. They belonged to others, and it was my responsibility to pass that on to the best of my ability. And that uh, from that point forward, I would dedicate my career to uh, working uh, with my people, working with tribal people, and working with tribal colleges. Uh, working with tribal people in any way that I could. <clears throat> and that was a personal decision that I made that day. And so from that moment forward, through my graduate studies, and then after my graduate studies, I went back to the tribal colleges. And that's where I've been for a number of years. <clears throat> so, which brings me, uh, I guess, uh, to where I'll fast forward to today. You know, why am I in Missoula? Why am I applying for a position here at the University of Montana. And uh, I've gotten to uh, some very interesting conversations between last night and today, uh, very good conversations. And uh, <clears throat> one of the questions that was asked of me is, you know, why, why do you want to come here? Through the work that I did in North Dakota, working for those six tribal colleges when I was there, and I had a chance to really see what tribal colleges could do and what they should do. And I also had, got a chance to see the realities of state institutions and the limitations of state institutions, especially attitudinal barriers. And uh, so when I think about what this job could be and what it could do, it's about knocking down some of those communication barriers. It's about forging partnerships in a way that hasn't really been done with state institutions and tribes and tribal colleges. And that's what I think this position can do. <clears throat> and working with UND, working with North Dakota State, um, I dealt with the intellectual bigotry. I dealt with that paternalistic bullshit attitude that most tribal people are all too familiar with. I've dealt with that. And quite honestly, you know, the only time that I have Dr. Bennett is when I'm in a room full of people that don't get it. The rest of the time, I'm just bull. 
And that's who I am. So my vision for NARL, for the Native American Research Lab, to begin with, it doesn't have any walls. <clears throat> that lab isn't a place, but it's the people that will work with it. It's the scientists, the talented scientists that are already on this ca campus that are working shoulder to shoulder with these talented scientists that are in the tribal colleges that are focused on student success and they are focused on issues that are relevant to Indian country. That's my vision for NARL. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a wet lab with a bench and a sink or those things, um, but it's an idea of forging meaningful partnerships that are built on, based on equity, um, that are based on family, and that are focused on those needs that Indian country deals with on a daily basis. And lately I've been, uh, some of you may know, some may not, uh, but I was appointed by the um, Secretary of Commerce to the National Climate Assessment. And uh, so uh, my job through that to volunteer was to bring this tribal voice to the climate assessment process. And as soon as they told me that, it's like, I can't speak for everybody. I can speak for me. And so when I think about not only the, the challenges and opportunities that Indian country faces, but some of those challenges are going to be exacerbated by a changing climate, and that's the reality. Here in the Northern Plains, water is going to be increasingly scarce. Potable water, drinkable water is going to be, if we're dealing with issues about that now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, that's gonna be the topic. And so the tribes have opportunities, um, and some are, uh, some are further ahead than others, but really understanding and applying the, their treaty rights as it relates to water and their natural resources. And that's sovereignty. But the challenges that tribes face, uh, the reality of a tribal college is that they're there because the state institutions failed. They're there because in state institutions would go out to Indian country, they would say, come and sign up for this class, they get three credits in whatever, pick a topic, and then they would disappear. And then another state institution would show up in Indian country, sign up for my, my class, get this higher ed training, two more credits, and then they disappear. <clears throat> and that happened time and time again. And so you have tribal people with 200 plus credit hours and no degree, no degree. So tribal colleges exist because the state institutions failed them. And now they are in a position where they are crucial to the sustainability and the ability of tribes to thrive in, in a changing environment. And having been among tribal colleges as long as I have, I've seen that proven time and time again. It's one of the most sustainable entities in Indian country. Tribal governments recycle themselves every two to four years. Tribal colleges are there to stay. <clears throat> and so because of that, there is a resource, an understaffed, overworked, underfunded resource to the tribal people that has chartered them. And so my challenge isn't to Indian country, but my challenge is to the University of Montana. Are you ready to engage in a partnership with the tribes and tribal colleges, a real partnership? Are you ready for that? Because if you are, then there's some very, very cool things that can happen. And if you're not, then, well, you're not gonna gain anything and we stay where we're at. Tribal college faculty are among, are, are among the hardest working people I've ever been around. You show me a faculty on this campus that teaches 21 credit hours in a semester and is still obliged to do research, is still obliged to mentor and tutor students, is still obliged to serve on the self-study committee accreditation, and still has to do extension and outreach. You show me somebody, one person, on this campus that does that. And I will show you dozens in tribal colleges that do that every year. 
<clears throat> so that's the reality of tribal colleges. And yet, that is where the partnerships have to be forged. And they have to be forged based on equity. And that's how I see it. So, um, I know I've rambled quite a bit, uh, but I wanted to cut to the chase here. Uh, certainly, funding is going to be a major question. Uh, how do you fund NARL? <clears throat> well, it, unfortunately, given the current funding environment, we don't have a cash cow that we can draw from, and so we have to be creative. And once again, it comes back to that, those principles of family, of partnerships that are based on equity, and it's being creative in how we seek out those funding sources. Okay? It may not be just an NSF. It may not be just an NIH. It may not be just NASA. But it's going to be a conglomeration of all that have every one of the agencies have two mandates. One, you address climate change. Two, you partner with the tribes. You decide how. Every one of them. And almost two, though, agency, with the exception of probably EPA and maybe a couple others, USDA. Agencies don't know how to engage in, with the tribes in an appropriate way, especially on the climate change issue. They don't have answers. How do you fund NARL? Is by pulling together those agencies that are willing to pony up a million here, 500,000 there, and you get enough of those that are focused on a topic that's relevant to Indian country, that's relevant to the University of Montana, and you focus that research on that. They don't fund people, they fund good ideas. And you get enough of the partners sitting at the table, not as funders, but as partners. And whenever I have a conversation with DOD or DOE or NASA or anybody else, I never talk money. I never talk money. I talk about relationships and I talk about partners. I said, if you're willing to work with me, then roll up your sleeves and let's get busy. If you're not, then don't waste my time. And my reality is that I work with people who want to work with me. And if people choose not to work with me, it um, doesn't hurt my feelings. Um, they have other direction to go. <clears throat> so um, I guess I'm going to go ahead and just kind of shut it down now. And because this is, I did want this to be a, a conversation and give you guys a chance to, to talk openly and transparently and honestly with me. So I want to say we all into the search committee and to all of you for welcoming me, welcoming me here to this campus and, and uh, for this time. We love it. Thank you. So, I have to ask <clears throat> the forgiveness of my manners, but I acknowledge the tribal councils. If tribal council people are in the room, you please stand and acknowledge who you are. You also have the first crack at questions if you want. You, you don't have to, but I want to acknowledge the councils. What, it's such a, an honor to have tribal council people here, nations to nations, to come to this campus. And I hope the uh, faculty, well, I know they, they do, but they appreciate these tribal council people to represent the nations that they represent. Go ahead, introduce yourself. Uh, you know, I, I like the setting so I'm going to Oki Ganako, it's the Apoi Ki Vidots and in black, you know what I'm saying? Hello, my name is uh, Stan Zimone. My, my first name and my other name is Chief on both sides. And these were names that were passed down to me, you know, through the elders and, and the person I know when our veterans who passed. But, but currently, my, I go by Rusty Taxi. <coughs> taxi come from Odot. Odot, uh, uh, what's that? And, and when I give out English name, Taxi came from the black word of, you know, black name. But I, I respect your setting. I can relate to your whole upbringing of freezing and running to the stove. And as one does, I run across and make fire for my family. You're the second oldest of ten children, you know, in my family. I can relate to your stories and going through the, the colleges and or your educational process, and your life. <clears throat> right now, with the Department of Justice, or yeah, Department of Justice, court settlements, court claims on reservations where they count for the past, back in time, from the Buffalo. They took the Buffalo up to 1934 to give you money to cover that. 
$450,000 to cover that year, those years for loss of resources to Blackfeet people. Right now we're in the process of settling one from 1982 to the present. He talked about the storage tanks, <clears throat> the trust that we had in the Bureau, <laughs> which I, I heard you mention, you know, and, and, the, and the financial loss and whatnot, but it's based upon money, which once again he said he don't believe in money as a, in, in but it's that relationship, the partnership of, of solving something like we call it Skumapi, the Mother Earth, you know, the purity of the Earth and whatnot, and, and the health and the benefits of people, the safety of our future, climate change. In the last 20 years, on the east side of the Rockies here, as where we live, it's, you know, the, um, the droughts, not just here, but across the kind of national level, but, and, and addressing these concerns. We're also, on Thursday, we're actually going to talk about our water rights as black people in Great Falls. You know, we want to take this quantification of water as senior, as the senior rights of the water on the east slope to the Rockies. <clears throat> How much of that we want, or actually, we want all of it, or, but yet, as you go down away from the Rockies, and you go down to the streams, and, and you see that the water not being drinkable, in a sense, you know, this, and we talk about you know, the purity of Mother Earth again. And how do we keep that clean? We do it by quantifying it in a certain amount, 500, was it 590 million uh, <coughs> feet of water is for us to use. You know, we don't just want to think of ourselves and want to say, but we want to think of everything as a whole. And I, I respect what you're, uh, what you're doing. Uh, I guess how, you, how your mind is thinking uh, as, as you oversee the, the whole of things. Kind of the global sense as some people talk of education on a global level. But I also understand the need of community colleges. They talk about the collaborative efforts of this college, perhaps working with another college, university in another state. But that localization of community colleges in this college here and the study, the resource available to study for the needs of our reservations, perhaps not just in the state of Montana, but <coughs> All states. I went to Flanders, South Dakota Indian School where they had brought in 89 different states, tribes from all those states together. I went to the Haskell Indian Junior College where they brought natives in from all 50 states. So I have that relationship with you know all these different tribes and people. And but our needs were common, some were unique in our areas. But in, in addressing this the connection of our this is the field band and I'm going to branch out to help, help and support others. It just, um, you know, it just kind of, a, I like your thoughts behind that. And my mind is starting to slip here, but sometimes I think that's all I have to say. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Council here, introduce yourself, please. My name is Sean Hackle. That's a from the Crow tribe. Uh, my Indian name is Ewago Danji Wogia. One who prays all over the land, given to me by one of my clan uncles. You know, what you were talking about, family, you know, we're pretty knit back home. And uh, my, uh, I guess my Christian name is Sean Backbone. You know, what they uh, turn it around to, you know. And, and I, I'm a, we have an education committee back home. And I'm the secretary of that education committee. So I come down and I wanted to see, uh, you know, informed by my colleague here on what's going on here and uh, give us an opportunity to kind of uh, look on, you know, and uh, see something like this. You know, uh, just, it's, uh, it's a great thing, you know, giving a Native American opportunity to do this. You know, a long time ago, you know, the stories back home, you know, they take the kids, you know, they, they, they Christianize us, they colonize us, and they civilize us. Then they, they took the kids to go be educated. And now they're educated. When they're educated, they go back home now, they don't want nothing to do with them, you know. But now there's an opportunity here where, you know, you're talking about uh, yourself and you're trying to do something right for the people. You know, that lateral oppression is kind of there, but it's good too at the same time to, to bring somebody out like this. So that, that, that's why I'm here, you know, to, um, to see that and uh, to kind of relay the message, I guess, from, 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 from where we are. I wanted to say, you know, welcome to Crow Country, but then I have a lot of...
to keep it at that, you know, but it's, it's good. Today's good. You know, it's good. So I just want to say thank you. And uh, whatever, um, you know, my people, they come to college here and go to school here. So, you know, it's kind of a, an opportunity for us to come look on and uh, kind of uh, see what goes on here, too. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. My name is, uh, my, my code name is Shigat Machua. And uh, fortunate, fortunate boy, given to me by a son of my World War II veteran. Uh, he, he, he uh, you know, he went through a lot in World War II, but he made it back home. You know, combat veteran. So that, that's my name. My uh, English name is uh, Dana Wilson. Uh, Wilson come from uh, there was these crow boys that, you know, like uh, representative backbone set, you know, they, they rounded up all the crow kids and they sent them away to boarding school. And uh, then a lot of them, they, they named them after president. You know, Wilson, Lincoln, Jefferson, those are some of the names that uh, were given to some of these crow boys. And then they just kept it and then they went home, you know. But uh, I represent a uh, mighty few district crow legislature, crow tribe. And uh, I, I'm also a full-time student here, and uh, I hope to graduate this, this spring, geoscience degree. And uh, I, you know, I, I, something that I kind of told everybody, I've been to every one of these talks and I've, I've listened to what everybody said. And uh, <clears throat> kind of tell, you know, everybody the same thing about, uh, you know, one thing is tutoring. You know, I talked about tutoring. It would have been nice to have uh, group of native people being tutored all in the same room. You know, where is that, like physics, calculus, you know, some of these tough classes, they're hard for uh, some of these wild Indians, you know. <laughs> so, you go in there and we're kind of fighting over tutors with, uh, you know, with the rest of the, you know, white kids and whatnot, we, you know, and we, we don't win. So, <coughs> you know, I had some issues with that. Um, I've never heard about moral. You know, I've been a student here for four and a half years. My wife was here uh, for a year previous to that. She never heard about moral until this uh, gentleman over here told me about, uh, you know, what was going on. And uh, <coughs> you know, I thought that was kind of wrong because, you know, moral, you know, is a hard science. Geoscience is a hard science too, you know, and I wondered why, uh, how come I didn't know about it. You know, I'm not a physics major, I'm a pharmacy major, NAS major, forestry, but get, you know, I seem to get the emails all the time whenever it has anything to do with Native American type things, you know. Uh, hey, there's a scholarship for Native American pharmacists. I'm not a pharmacist, but at least I get it, you know. Never got nothing from Noro. Um, I seem to uh, really heavily recruit tribes outside of Montana. You look around in this room, you know, all the tribes represented in Montana are, are here. Um, this is uh, where this, you know, building stands. It was, uh, according to Mr. Grant, it's Blackfeet land here. And um, you know what I told the other guys, you know, we need to kind of focus on tribes in Montana instead of going across the ocean and bringing them guys in, you know, what's wrong with, what's wrong with some of the native students here in Montana is what I was thinking, you know. I don't think that, I think that uh, the, the, some of these reservation kids, they, they, they should have a shot too, you know. Um, they're right here, you don't have to go across the ocean, you don't have to go all across the you know, there's plenty of bright young minds right here in Montana, and I think that should be kind of one of the focuses. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you're here, and um, you know that you shared with us your your story, your journey, and how you 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 know you made it this far. Um, you know, it's kind of surprising what how far a smart Indian guy could go. You know, um, <laughs> smart question. I'll say that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, good to see you. Uh, I had a, a comment for the um, committee or for the university or whatever. Um, when it comes to hiring people, you know, uh, when, okay, so when I apply for a scholarship here, uh, Montana Indian fee, fee waiver, you know, I, I got to prove that. I got to prove that I'm, I'm Indian. You know, I, I can't say, oh, I'm Indian. Oh, yeah, come on in. You know, they, they don't do that. You know, I gotta prove it. I gotta say, hey, you know, here's my pedigree. I got this much, you know, here's who I am. <laughs> and uh, so, it seemed like there'd be, you know, when it comes to, to uh, 
individual that, that's been hired and that's going to be hired to help Native American people. You know, they should have a strong conviction in their heart. They should understand what these Native American people go through. Um, you know, like you talked about the Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, different reservations, you know, stuff that's been there, tough over there, you know. And um, it would be nice if, if uh, everybody had that type of uh, knowledge, and, you know, that way you could talk to students and, you know, hey, you know, I know, I kind of know what you're going through. You know, stay, stay in school and, and be a mentor to them instead of being like, uh, maybe you're some Mexican guy or maybe you're, some, you know, not even native and, and saying, yeah, I, I know what you're going through, you know, and they don't. Um, and then it would be nice if uh, the selection committee, if there are more Native American, you know, people on the selection committee, um, especially when you're dealing with, you know, somebody that's going to hire you, that's going to work directly with Native students, would be nice to see a better representative of Native American people on that committee. And uh, that's all i got to say. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Everybody. I think people that didn't know me probably know me by now. My name is Bill Swaney. I'm a faculty member at Salus Kootenai College, uh, where Bull has come and visited with us from time to time. I, too, have some uh, strongly held opinions, I guess, about the process. I hope to relay those to the search committee in written form, but uh, I agree with uh, our councilman from Crow to the extent, except to the extent that uh, the... Uh, People that once occupied this area. <laughs> <laughs> the, the my people uh, camped in this area on the oval. Um, my grandmother camped at the base of Everill Hill and you know, roots and berries and so forth. And, uh, so, so anyway, um, but uh, I, I heard heard your story, and I think I, I, I made it to every presentation that I could, I missed one, and uh, it's been a, a lot of interest, a lot of concern. I mean, clearly we have a, you're familiar with our programs, we have a, currently 121 students in our programs at SKC, just in, just in the programs that I direct. We also have a life sciences program as well, but, um, and we have about 90 what we call counters, uh, enrolled tribal members or first generation descendants. So, so we have a program that's potentially a, a strong source of uh, feeders to the institution down here. I know that under the current direction of the lab, um, that focus seems to be uh, more in the areas of health, sort of, um, I guess I would call microbiology, maybe uh, molecular biology. And I, want, I, I know a little bit about your background. I was wondering if you could speak to your vision of um, a blending of, of that sort of cellular molecular biology approach, that wet bench approach that, that I'm not into, and I'm not sure how much you're into that, but how would you, how would you propose to blend that sort of cellular molecular uh, biology approach with maybe an organismal biology approach? I, I personally believe that a lot of Native students are strongly interested in the organismal biology rather than molecular and cellular. I know there are a number of, that are. So how would you mix those two together to create a more effective, uh, a broader appeal, I guess I would say? Um, that's, thank you, Bill. Um, and I appreciate that question. Um, I, too, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a microbiologist. You know, uh, you guys have heard that, you know, I'm more of an, an ecologist than anything. Uh, in terms of uh, blending the two, um, you know, I don't bring that microbiology to the table, but there are people here that do. Um, if there were students, I would say this, that if there were students at SKC or any of the tribal colleges in Montana that wanted to take that path, there are scientists here that are very skilled scientists that can, and that's part of the team forging. Okay, that's part of bringing people together. And if the life, life science track at SKC is going in that direction, then there's a natural synergy there to bring together scientists from this campus that are focused in those areas to engage and mentor students who are wanting to take those paths. Um, but there's also a territory thing here that I want to address because it's very, very important. And oftentimes state institutions look at tribal colleges, Bill, and you know this as well as I do, as feeders. And so sometimes 
you see state institutions actually on tribal colleges plucking those freshmen sophomore, sophomores right out of classes and say, come to Montana or come to Montana State or come to UND, come to NDSU. And that's wrong because those students have to finish and, and it, certainly that's their choice. They can choose to stay at a tribal college or matriculate on to a state institution. So I do want to address that territory issue first. We have to, as part of this partnership building, this, this team building approach is to support each other in helping students finish where they start and then put in place a natural matriculation. So I wanted to get that out there so it was clear. <clears throat> but uh, to your point about for, uh, bringing together those that uh, are focused on a molecular level and those that are focused on an organismal or a population level. <clears throat> it's a scale issue, certainly, but uh, you know, the understanding that all things are related and there's a connection between, and it's a question of scale. <clears throat> and so, uh, how do you bring those two together? Um, I would say that it would be topic focus. So say for example, there was a, um, an identified observation that was occurring at, at, on Flathead, for example. Maybe it was environmental toxicology that required some kind of things, but it was impacting fish populations, or if it was impacting wildlife populations. There's an opportunity now to bring a chemist, a uh, molecular biologist, an ecologist, and a social scientist to the table to address an issue. And I think that's how it's done. And I think you look for those synergies. And the idea is to create an environment where the student is safe to make mistakes and to learn and to grow, um, but is also challenged uh, to reach beyond where they are at. Um, but I do think that building that community, that team approach to mentoring, I think that's how it's done. It's, I don't think it would be the position of the NARL director to dictate what the research agenda should be because I think those are going to come from those research teams. And then I'm certainly not qualified to talk about a molecular approach. Um, so I think that would have to come from those research teams. And I think we have tribal colleges are some of the most agile institutions I know. State institutions certainly have a, a, a very robust and rich uh, research environment and there's synergy there that can, that can be maximized. So I guess that's how I would address that, Bill. Any other questions? Here? Oh, and then here? Go ahead. Excuse me. My name is Frederica Hunter. I'm uh, the Director of American Human Services. I want, you said something in your, um, in your talk about, you know, partnering with tribal colleges and the university and looking at maybe commonalities that bring people to the table. Can you give us an example of that, what, what that might be like for Montana? Because I know that, you know, funding is going to be an ongoing um, struggle. And, I, you know, the partnership between tribes is really, really important. And it, what do you know about Montana in terms of our needs and engaging in tribal politics? And making the university part of that. First of all, I'd say that I'm not uh, qualified to speak to the tribal needs of Montana because I'm not from here and the experts are the very people themselves that are here. They're the ones who can speak to what their needs are. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking across the landscape, especially as you get on the eastern side of the Rockies and moving east, water is an issue. Whether it's through agriculture, whether it's drinking water, there's a surface fracking, there's both a surface and groundwater hydrology issue that the tribes are dealing with now and will continue to deal with both on a, a treaty level as well as on an application level as well. That is a focus area where the stakeholders, the tribal people and their needs, <clears throat> uh, the scientists with the expertise, whether they be in uh, geosciences, whether they be in uh, uh, specifically hydrologists, you know, chemists, those kinds of things. Once again, it's bringing those people to the table. And the expertise will emerge, the, the focus will emerge from that, that synergy, that partnership. That's how I believe it. 
Um, and in terms of, uh, um, I want to make sure I'm answering your question. Did I cover part of the points no, anyway? Okay. So um, refresh me again on what was the other points well, that you. You know, I think this position is so important. It's, it's key in bringing together tribes of mm -hmm. Montana and then, you know, some commonalities that we have. You talked a little bit about, you know, water. Water's mm -hmm. an issue. The natural resources within Montana. Um, <coughs> so the, I see your position as being key to um, bringing together um, tribes and, and maybe um, addressing some of those, those needs within our community. Right. Well, um, certainly, absolutely, I would see that the, the, one of the key uh, fundamental uh, jobs of this position is to facilitate those discussions, I think. And that's going to take a lot of windshield time. I think that's going to be very, very important. It's getting out and working, talking with tribal people, elders, program managers, councilmen, uh, tribal college faculty, staff, presidents. It's going to take that kind of uh, time. Um, <clears throat> and it's, I don't think it's the, I don't think it's appropriate for this position to dictate what the research might be. I think it would be important to contribute to that. But the issue is going to come from that interaction. In and the, I agree. I do agree. I think it's um, not the position to dictate to tribes. I think sure. it's, to, it's to incorporate like, the Thank you. Sure. Question here. <coughs> Hi. My name is Jerry. I value the last meeting. So I, I, I want to address a couple of quick things. Um, politics, pushbacks, and geoscience. Politics. There's always politics. There are politics. And I think that this position has become even more political because it is such an extraordinary, rare position to have a tenured Native American in a hard science. So, in how are we going to deal with the, the political side of that while my, maintaining all of the things that you talked about? You're the only person that's come in the three meetings that I've been to that has even said the word Indian country. I don't think any of maybe I, I don't know if the search community realizes what that is or how important that is to the thought processes of over 600 students that attend this university. But that's where we're from. And that's who we are. And you're the first person that said it. So, thank you. But, so politics, pushback from the politics. And I'm a geoscience major, just like our Crow legislator, Mr. Wilson. And um, geoscience, man, we're hard science. We like to do research. <laughs> we want to do research. I don't need to get paid. Just give me something to do. You know? <laughs> I don't even need my name on shit. I just want to do something. I've been here four years trying to get a research opportunity. And I. It's good. I've So, how are. What, what is that going to look like on campus? Um, are you going, you know, I, I think that having been the general manager of a casino, being in charge of a multi-million dollar corporation, and having to spend hours trying to find 10 cents because our books were off, I mean, hours. I know what is important in, in uh, that kind of a system, you know. This, this is a multi-million dollar system, this university. That was a multi-million dollar system, that, that casino. And you know what's most important? When you're sitting there at 3 o'clock in the morning trying to find 10 cents for the 17th time, I just give you a it's not that I have a bachelor's degree. It's not that the lady sitting in the cage is you know, a CPA. You know what's important? That she and I can talk to each other. 
that she and I don't get pissed off at each other because neither of us can find this 10 cents. I've counted down the till 16 times. She's counted it down 16 times. We've gone through the master list. We've done all of that we're supposed to do. Relationships. <coughs> that is what's important. And, and I think you were one of the few that has emphasized that. So how are you going to balance building all of these relationships that are so important with your own personal research as a PhD? <coughs> Those are excellent points and excellent question, and thank you. Um, before I answer your question, I wanna uh, tell this story. Um, you guys know who Bill Russell is, right? Famous Boston Celtic, right? Uh, 11 championships with the Boston Celtics. One of my favorite human beings. And I remember a long time ago, I was uh, watching a, a, a retake of an interview that he gave and some mousy little reporter, you know, this is at the height of Bill Russell's career. Mr. Russell, Mr. Russell, you know, what's it like to be the greatest basketball player on the planet or ever? And uh, he stopped me, thought about it for a second. And he says, I'm not a basketball player. I'm a black man. Basketball is just what I do. So to begin to answer your question, <clears throat> I'm not a scientist. I'm a native man. Science is just what I do. So in terms of the political nature of what this job, I can't speak to what it has been because that's not my place. I know it doesn't exist. Okay, I can only speak to uh, what it could be. Um, the politics, I'm not a politician, okay? That's not what I do, okay? Um, so in terms of the politics, I'm not interested in those dramas or intrigue. I'm interested in uh, providing opportunities for our students to engage in, in research, to learn uh, the scientific method, and to be able to embrace research topics that are most important to them, whether it's tribal or otherwise. But I think that decision comes from the person themselves with the mentoring of the team that's around them, uh, the scientists, the faculty, and so on. And so I think that's what drives the research agenda for that. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the pushback, uh, I guess to the point I just made is I'm not interested in the push, the political pushback. That's not what I do. Uh, people have their dramas. Everybody does. Uh, that's not who I am and that's not what I do. And that's not why I'm here. Uh, in terms of balancing the <clears throat> this relationship building that I think is so critically important in order for this lab to be successful with my own research agenda. <clears throat> That's a very, very good question and it really cuts to the heart of what this position is. And uh, that's, I'm not delusional about that kind of challenge. And the fact is that my personal research agenda is less important than the research that the teams will, will bring together. Uh, okay. Um, it's not about me. It truly isn't about me. Uh, and it, it's not about me. It's about what can happen through appropriate relationships. The other thing I'll say to you is don't give up. Don't give up. There was a time that uh, I remember when I first started talking about climate change and I was invited to give a speak at the Intertribal Summit in Bismarck. And uh, I was the last speaker on the last day before the summit concluded and they went into conducting business. And this big auditorium in the Bismarck Civic Center. And uh, I stood up there with my microphone and my slide presentation. And all these tribal people, at the end of the day, everybody gets up and they make their way to the back. They're on their way to the powwow or they're talking about where they're gonna go eat dinner. And, all of that, right? And, and I'm watching this as I'm giving this talk, and I'm talking about the Ross Ice Shelf that broke off in the Antarctic, okay? This was a chunk of ice the size of Rhode Island, okay? There's some significant change that's happening on a global scale that's going to be felt very, very locally. And as tribal people, we have to embrace that sense of urgency for the sustainability of our people into the future. And I couldn't understand why all these tribal leaders were leaving. This was such an important topic. And there were two men that sat in the back and they didn't get up. And uh, so they just sat there and they were watching. 
I didn't say anything. Halfway through my talk, I felt nobody was interesting. I shut it down. I said, I'm done. You know, and it didn't help that the moderator introduced my talk as the end of the world talk. It's like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, and so I was frustrated. I shut it down. I grabbed my, packed up my stuff, and I was, I was on my way home. And as I was walking out the door, these two men got up, and they came over to me. And uh, the two men were Lionel Bordeaux, who's the president of Sinti Galeshka University, and Ron, his horse's thunder, and at the time was the tribal chairman for the Standing Rock Sioux tribe. And Lionel says to me, he says, Mo, don't ever stop talking. They will hear you someday. Don't stop talking. And that's all he said to me. And Ron didn't say anything. But that resonated with me. And so what I want to share with you is don't stop. Don't give up. If you haven't gotten that research opportunity now, it doesn't mean that you can't. I'm not sure where you're at in your academic career, if you're still an undergrad or you're looking at grad school or whatnot. Uh, about my fourth year undergrad. Okay. There's still opportunities to engage in undergraduate research. And I think that has to be a, a critical element to what, in developing a, a NARL, a research laboratory on this campus. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, it's not one physical location, but it's across the campus and it's across the tribal colleges too. I think that's what becomes the NARL lab. Whether you're an undergraduate, a native undergraduate here, or a native undergraduate at one of the tribal colleges, that should be an opportunity for those students to come in and, and, and engage in that kind of research activity. There shouldn't be any doors closed. So um, again, and to my point, uh, you know, I'm, uh, my background is in ecology and now climate change. You know, um, those are very near and dear to me. Um, but it's less about my personal agenda in terms of research than what the team will, um, will decide what's most important. And that team has to be a combination of the scientists here, the scientists at tribal colleges, tribal program managers, our tribal councilmen and representatives, um, our tribal elders. There's, those are our team members and those students that would actually be in the trenches getting the work done. Everybody, all those stakeholders have to have a say. And that's the, what the research agenda should be. They can't be mine. <clears throat> Question here and then here. Um, I'm Kate Challey and I teach in Native American Studies. Um, and I'm a Cinnaboyne from Fort Peck. My brother, Jim Challey, yeah. just retired. Yeah. Um, and so I, I thought, if this is a conversation, I'll tell you a story about my old Bordeaux. <laughs> Oh, yeah, my brother retired from Fort Peck after 27 years, and uh, you all know how hard it is to keep the secret in, in the thought of community. <laughs> and so they were going to have this big um, party for him to celebrate him. And so the way they set it up was they had the Christmas party for the tribal college on Friday, and then his real goodbye party was on Sunday. And you know, they even ran the ads on the radio, because he never listened to the radio. <laughs> and some of the way my brother has gotten to where he is today, he's just about as pig-headed as a human being can be. So if he decides things are a certain way, he doesn't listen. He doesn't hear you if you say, no, it's another way. So Sunday, we're all home. All of us kids came home for this. And we're trying to figure out how to get him down to the Legion Club for his uh, party. And we get, um, so his son decides to take him down there. And they run to the convenience store to get something. And who should be in the convenience store but Lionel Bordeaux? And so we said, hey, what you doing? You know, Lionel and my brother and a number of other people started the travel call. Right. I mean, and I think Blyden was the last one to so. retire from that first bunch. Uh, Dave, Dave's still in the right. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so uh, Lionel said, well, I'm here for your party. And Jim said, oh, I'm sorry, bud, you missed it. It was on Friday. But let, come on down to Legion. I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> 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 so he walked, he walked into the Legion, and he was totally surprised that that was his point. At any rate, um, I thought I'd just tell you that. Thank you.
And I, I want to thank you for doing this thing you're doing here. Um, probably the leading Indian intellectual in the 20th century is behind Gloria. And every summer over at Nami, they have a gathering. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they do, which I think would make a lot of people laugh, is they don't allow PowerPoints. <laughs> and um, when I came in and saw the circle, and I looked for the PowerPoint, and there was no PowerPoint, I thought, wow, we're really in for it. <laughs> so I thank you for that. And I thank you, too, for speaking from your heart, because I really believe that's what you do. And that's such an important discourse in Indian country. Any place you go, people will recognize that if you do that. So I want to thank you for that also. And then my question then comes out of those two things, comes out of that level of a question that I know that the search committee is going to ask. And that question has to do with um, a kind of university level idea of professionalism. And whether or not you have the ability, to, I mean, I'm being a devil's advocate here. Do you have the ability to create the kind of professionalism in these students that will enable them to give a paper at Harvard or walk through any door to a job interview or speak in the discourse terms of a place like this? That's an excellent question, a very important question. <clears throat> And I guess I would respond to, uh, I'll just respond this way. That, you know, I was taught that, you know, and it's really tough for me in job interviews because I'm supposed to really be promoting myself. And, but that's not the Indian way, you know. That's not the way I was taught. I was taught to be, demonstrate humility. And so, um, I guess my response to your question, this very, very important question, is this. If you want to know about my professionalism and my abilities to help students obtain that level, um, I would ask you to talk to the students I've mentored. And then I would also ask you, well, what is your perception of me? Am I professional enough? You know, have I, do I represent myself in a good way? Um, and is, do I represent myself that would honor the University of Montana or the tribal, my family here? Do I represent myself in a good way? How I mentor is from my own experiences and what I think it should be. There's a time for uh, PowerPoints, and then there's a time for, as Dan Wildcat would say, the Yuchi PowerPoint, which is, okay. And, you know, and, and uh, Ed had, had emailed me um, and asked if I needed a, you know, if I was going to do a PowerPoint tonight. And it's like, well, no, I'm not. I don't need one. Because that's not what the nature of this discussion needed to be. And uh, you guys didn't need me to stand up here in my tie and uh, tell, you, tell you about what things are going, what needed to be. You know, that's not what you needed. And that's not who I am. And so I have the ability to stand up and testify in front of the highest level and have that conversation. And then the, as soon as that conversation's over, is to walk in, sit down at a computer next to one of my students, roll up my sleeves, and talk about uh, uh, calculated and reflectance on a Landsat image so you can calculate a vegetation indices and get some kind of indication of vegetative health. And I can have those conversations. Now, I'm not saying I'm a role model. I'm just saying that's what I do. Um, and I like to lead by example. And so if students that work directly with me, whether they're undergraduate or graduate students or postdocs, that's what they're going to get. And uh, I also have to be mindful. And you bring up a very good point because, you know, Lionel and Dave are the only two left now. You know, these are legends among tribal colleges. And what is quite scary is who's going to replace them. And we've been pretty fortunate with this new generation of tribal college leadership that has emerged has done very well. And so when I'm working, I'm always cognizant about who's going, who is going to replace me? What can I do to help them learn what I learned, know what I know, and become more than me? And so it's always spinning in the back of my mind. 
So um, to your question of professionalism, I would ask you, have, have I been professional enough in this, in this talk? Was I professional enough earlier today when I gave my presentation on Blackfoot Affairs? You know, was I pro professional enough when I stood up in front of these tribal leaders and talked about climate impacts and the urgency? Was I professional enough? Um, and so I don't feel I'm qualified to answer that question that way, but the, my students who work with me, the people that have worked with me, I believe they're the ones who are most qualified to answer that question. Thank you. Let's go here first, Roman, if you don't mind. Then I'll go to you ladies first. Go ahead. Paul. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Age before. <Yeah. laughs> I just wanted to thank you for, um, for your path that brought you to, um, to the PhD and beyond. And, you know, I thank you from the student perspective because you give us role models. But I thank you also from, you know, these children's perspective too because it's them that are coming behind us. You know, we understand the struggle because, you know, I didn't have water until I was 22 or off and on electricity until I was 34. You know, we, we understand that from an adult perspective and, and the role model that you provide for us. And we understand the struggle that it took for you to get where you are because we're walking that struggle and a lot of us are seeing that. And so, you know, I just want to say thank you for for being a role model to us. I want to thank everyone here, our council members, everyone that's come so far to be here, you know, to understand and, and to, to try to have a voice in this selection. And it just means a lot to us that you've, you've traveled all this way. It means a lot to us what you've done to get to where you are. And I just wanted to thank you for that. So. Thank you. Vernon, go ahead. <laughs> Since this is such an informal setting, which is good. That way we're gonna uh, tell stories and whatnot in, in a different kind of way, which I was talking about before. But on behalf of Mr. Wilson and Mr. Swaney, I'd like to welcome you to Blackfeet Country. Do we need to move the chairs back so no one can take any more covers? Sounds like we're about to have a gnarled WWE session. <laughs> so I might not have to say it, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've been listening to a lot of what the people were saying. And, you know, seeing as though this is, this is the last, the last um, talk we're going to have, I think it, it is appropriate to not only address the candidate, but, but take an opportunity to even address the, the committee. Because, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about a Native American research lab. You know, and <clears throat> personally, I don't, you know, I don't have anything against other people. I don't have anything against international people, Indians from out of state. In fact, I've been mentored by non-Indians my entire academic career who I, I greatly love, trust, and respect, you know, but, <clears throat> you know, when we're talking about this lab, you know, if, if you, for instance, if you say, we're going to institute an African-American research lab, and then they hire an Asian to run it, do you think that makes sense? You know, so what I'm getting at is, if we're running if, if this is advertised, if this is truly a Native American research lab, not only should it be ran by Native American, but when we're talking about issues and, and, and how to go about selecting this person, you know, Indian people should be involved in that entire process. And I've heard that spoken tonight by a few different people. And you know, what, what, I, what I see happening to me and, you know, <clears throat> when we talk about Indian people, what my kids ain't being taught in school is, is what happened to my, my grandfathers, my dad, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, from the time when the buffalo were decimated, which you talked about today, to where <clears throat> our people became dependent on the U.S. government. You know, there were, there were winters where we were given blankets that were infested with smallpox. So we died there. You know, there was, in, in Blackfeet, 
there's a starvation winter of 1883. You know, there's just countless things that happen in the boarding school era. The reason I bring that up and I can go there is because what I see happening is in and people are, are awakening. They're, they're opening their eyes. And no longer are we inferior. And I'm not saying we're superior, but for the longest time, you know, that's been the, the ideology. That's been what the outlook, the perspective, the, the perception on us, you know. And the reason I say I don't have anything against anybody else is because I know what it feels like to be discriminated against. <clears throat> you know, I, I grew up on the res my whole life. And I was lucky to make it a cup thing, you know. And, and our bus said rounding Indians on it, you know. And when we go places, I remember getting stuff thrown at our bus, people flipping us off. You know, calling us Indians in, in, in a different way, you know? So I know what it feels like. And, and so what I'm getting at is, you know, the playing field is being leveled because Indian people are waking up. And, and you know what? We can figure things out. We can problem solve. We can, we can do everything anybody else can do. There's just so few of us now. But we're slowly emerging, you know? And, and this is a really important Position. And I say this because, not about me, you know, and like you said, you know, not about anybody else. I'm on my way out. What I think about is my nephews and, and my, my cousins and all my people back home who may come here someday. And the thing about it is, is right now it's exclusive. They're not included. It's not inclusive. And, and that's what I hear you speaking about. And I, and I just wanted to thank you for that. You know, and <clears throat> you know, one, one thing uh, I always remember is that when I came in to give a presentation one time, you told me, it's not even about getting a PhD, it's what you do with it. And that stuck with me, you know. It's, my goal isn't just to get the PhD. I want to do something with it. I want to go places. I want to I wanna help my people. I want to help Indian people. That's my passion, you know. And so, you know, we need people role models that will instill that in, in, in students here, in Indian students. <clears throat> and you hit it right on the head when you said, um, I can't remember where, if it was at this talk or the one earlier, but there's a pool of, of Indian students right here to draw from. And it doesn't make sense to me that they're not included in the normal lab right now. And so that's, that's big for me. Uh, and again, you know, I don't have anything against any other people. People have their own opinion and can think what they want. But, you know, it makes sense that when you have 600 or, or five, 600 Indian students right here, you know, why go looking for them in China? You know, you have them right here. So my question to you then is, how do you plan to include Indian students? Because we've talked about making those alliances with tribes and tribal colleges. But how do you plan to include them right here? And, and actually, it's, it's almost like a three-phase question. The next part is, is, once you get them there, once you open that door, they're gonna flood in. They're gonna come from every discipline, you know? Because the fact of the matter is, is and I've said this before, there is no Indian, true Indian role model here on this campus. That's faculty, and a faculty to be tenured position. So, you know, if, if students are drawn to you, you're gonna have an overwhelming amount coming to you. So, how do you plan to, um, how do you plan to address that? In terms of uh, the volume of students you're gonna have, you know, do you, with, with, you know, uh, branching out into different departments or whatnot. And then the third part is, is can, you, can you talk about um, your experience with mentoring students, specifically getting through master's and PhD level, uh, dissertations, thesis, and research projects? And I, and I know that's kind of a long-winded question and even comment, but uh, if, if you can speak to that. <laughs> Vernie, you covered a lot of ground. 
and I will do my best and I may have to ask you to refresh me on those points so I can address those because they're all very good points. Um, so if I understand the first question, how do I engage tribal call or tribal students that are already present on campus? Is that the first question? <clears throat> I can't do it by myself. There's no way. I can't do it. But just in the course of today's discussions, I ran on to a number of people who would be willing to help me. You know, the Selena's office right behind me, that's what we talked about. Okay, had a chance to visit with uh, Annie Belcourt, who brings that uh, social dimension to science. Um, truly very important, especially when you look at a holistic approach. I need help. You know, Rachel Smith, okay, uh, Mary and Alice, I need help to do those things. I can't do it by myself. And I have to um, work with that team and people like that to come up with a way to accommodate those students here. But the, uh, I can't speak to whatever the existing environment is now. But to address that question, I can't do it alone. And I need help. And I need help from mentors like yourself too, because you have institutional experience here. You've learned how to survive here. And that's invaluable to your nephews and those other students that would come to this campus. Okay, so that's the first question. And what was the second question now? The second question was, was once you give them that, and like I said, they're gonna fly out. How do you, how, how, what, are, what are strategies or, or ways you see to, to accommodate them? Not necessarily accommodating them, but where, how do you plan to get them through their degrees? <clears throat> Again, I'll, um, I can't do it by myself. It's, and it really wouldn't be my plan, but it would be a team plan. Um, and that is, there are resources on this campus from the registrar's office, to the student services office, to the Native American Center, um, student services. Those kind of offices are specifically positioned to help students survive and thrive on this campus. And I have to be able to draw upon those as part of the, they're part of the family too. And they have to be able to weigh in on this and help provide those solutions. Because you're absolutely right. I'm one person. What do I do when 600 native students walk through the door? Well, probably the first thing I'll say is, uh, who's got a good fry bread recipe? Because <laughs> yeah, we all have to eat, right? Um, but seriously, that's an important question. And once again, I'd have to fall back on the resources that are here. Um, and not just the resources that are here, too, because every one of those of the students that are on this campus come from a strong family tie back home. And what oftentimes goes misunderstood is the kind of commitment it takes to come to an institution. It isn't an individual decision most times, it's a family decision. And so the family has to be able to, uh, especially if the student is making an important decision like that, you know, they have to be aware. And I need help. I can't do it by myself. Okay, so I'll, the task for this would be to get to know all of the players and what they can do and what, can they, what they can do to help students be successful. Okay, so your third question. And then I was wondering if you could speak to, to the audience about your experience mentoring masters and PhDs. <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll even take it a step further and I'll talk about my undergraduate students that I've mentored um, and then talk about those two. Uh, my mentoring approach is based on uh, my own experiences and thinking back when I was at the, working for the Forest Service and working for the tribe in those internships, what were the things that I needed? And my philosophy is that if we want students to be successful working in a lab or working on research, then that should be the only thing that they focus on. And so what does that really mean? So think about it. I know in tribal colleges, the dynamic is typically 29 to 33 year old female with multiple dependents. And if that student was going to engage in research, and if her only concern was her research, what does that mean? And that talks to their realities called pampers, gas, going home for ceremonies, going home to see family. Those needs have to be met. 
such that the only concern that student has is being successful you know, in their research. Okay. So that's kind of, that's what my mentoring approach is, is attempting to, to the best of my ability, uh, meet student needs. <clears throat> so when I was in North Dakota, uh, and again, you know, as Indians, we tell stories. So when I was in North Dakota, um, I remember I was working for North Dakota Association of Tribal Colleges, and I get a phone call from this uh, uh, neuroscience uh, scientist at UND. And uh, he calls me up, I don't know him, introduces himself, Van Dose. Ruth, you remember Van? Okay. And he's like, uh, uh, Dr. Bennett, you know, this is Dr. Doe's UND. I have funding for one student to come and do, uh, uh, to do research in my neuroscience lab. And I want it to be a tribal college student. I don't know how to do it. So like, well, that's a very compelling question, Dr. Doe's. I said, uh, do you really want my help? And he's like, well, yes. I said, no, seriously, do you really want my help? <laughs> and he said, yes, I do. And over the course of the next two hours on that phone call, we mapped out a new model for engaging uh, tribal college students in a neuroscience internship. Van worked his magic at UND, and he found enough funding to take that one position and turn it into three. And what we built was a, uh, a research experience that provided childcare, that provided gas money, that provided those things to meet student needs. And we test drove that. We got three students, one from Turtle Mountain and two from Spirit Lake to come over uh, that summer. And all three of those students performed beautifully. Two of the three students had dependent children with them. One of those students brought their sister with them uh, to watch the kids. And so the extra money was to, to help that sister while she was watching the kids so that she could go to the lab and work. And that's the kind of agility that it takes. Uh, so based on that pilot, if you will, uh, we decided we wanted to write to the National Science Foundation for a formal research experience for undergraduates. These are very highly competitive uh, programs. <clears throat> and as I understood the, the dynamics of it, those people that, and institutions that submit REUs to the National Science Foundation it's very rare they get funded right out of the chute. Usually it takes two or three iterations before you get it funded. So what we developed was actually two REUs in one. <coughs> Excuse me. The first REU focused on uh, providing a research opportunity for rural students. Non-Indian, live out in rural communities that does not have access to research opportunities to come to UND and do neuroscience research in uh, Vance Lab. The second half of that was a tribal college specific REU, which would bring at least seven students from the tribal colleges into that same neuroscience lab. And we used the model that we piloted. And uh, I'm very proud to say that our first attempt at an NSF REU got funded. And it was largely built on, uh, based on the model that Van and I put together for that. Okay, sorry, Ruth. <laughs> Um, and that was, that's what prompted the idea of doing a tribal college exclusive REU. And so based on the success from that first REU, working with Dr. Doe's, um, I approached Sitting Bull College, well, all the tribal colleges in North Dakota, and asked if they would want to participate in a tribal college specific REU. Um, at the time, the only two faculty that were really engaged in research was uh, uh, a faculty from Sitting Bull and then a faculty from Turtle Mountain. And so those would be the research environments in which those students, but we would draw from all of the tribal colleges in North Dakota. And so we used that model and applied it to a tribal college specific REU and right out of the chute it got funded. And uh, um, so far I haven't really talked about my personal mentoring with students in that. Uh, during the uh, recruitment phase of that, it took FaceTime with students in their classes, on their campuses, talking about what these opportunities could be. And presenting them in a, in a way that, uh, um, and so one of the questions I'd lead off is, how many of you, um, how many of you have kids? And you know, most of them raise their hand, I have kids. <clears throat> and uh, so I said, how many of you have ever seen an opportunity to do research, but 
immediately dismissed it because, you know, who's going to watch your kids? And to the person, every one of them. So I said, what if we had child care taken care of? Would you participate? And every one of them said yes. And that's, that was what the hook was. Okay. But then when they got into the lab, that's when the science happened. And that's when the lights and the enthusiasm and all that stuff took off. But it was really based on meeting student needs. <clears throat> now, um, my own personal experiences, um, when I was at NDATC, uh, we had a small NASA grant that uh, would take, you know, two to three um, tribal college students and spend 10 weeks at Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, plugged into engineers and scientists at Goddard. And so it was my job to get these students, recruit the students, get them ready to go, and then give them a big fat dose of DC before they got there. And so most of that mentoring it wasn't so much about the research and science that they would do, but it was really life coaching. You don't walk around Greenbelt, Maryland with your payroll in your pocket. And some of the students did. Um, and we were all learning as we go. But it took going with those students to Goddard and spending the necessary time making sure that they were settled in and their mentoring was taken care of, uh, their uh, housing was taken care of, their food plans were taken care of, they had a, um, a bank account set up at Goddard Space Flight, and they had debit cards that they could pull down. All that stuff had to be taken care of, and so I spent the time myself with those, each and every one of those students making sure that all of their needs were met before I went back to North Dakota to do other work. But I didn't just leave them there. Um, so I spent a week to two weeks with them on the front end of a 10-week internship. And then I went out midterm, so they were on their own really about two weeks at any one time. And then I went back out and spent another series of days with those students. And then at the end, I'd go out at least a week and a half before they were done to help them wrap up their research and uh, uh, prepare for that graduation ceremony out of Goddard. And then I would bring them home. And that's because, and I did that because if I were in their shoes, that's what I would want. I would want the kind of freedom where I can explore DC and Goddard on my own, but you know what, if I'm coming off of Fort Berthold, or if I'm coming off of uh, Spirit Lake and I've never been to DC before, that's pretty damn scary. And so I wanted to make sure that they were comfortable. They knew how to ride the Metro. Okay, they knew how to get down to the mall. They knew how to get to the Smithsonian and all those key places. Those were things that I felt was my responsibility in order for my students to be successful. So that was my first uh, cut at one-on-one -on -one mentoring with students and then as I saw the limitations of that it's really really difficult for tribal students um, to leave home for 10 weeks and go out to Goddard or go to JSC or go to Kennedy or Ames or places like that and you're so far from home and you have no way to get back and it's lonely and it's hard and it's depressing and there's a lot of sadness and a lot of pain that's involved family members call and they, they miss them or they put pressure on them to come home. And those are realities. And so that began the conversations uh, primarily with the program managers at, now, at Goddard saying how do we get these internships out of the centers, get them out into, country, into Indian country for two reasons. One, so that the students will uh, enter in and be successful um, uh, and be successful in those internships, but two is how do we make NASA relevant to Indian country? And honestly, Indians don't give a shit about rockets. That's, I'm paraphrasing, but that wasn't what the, in, the interest was. How do you make NASA relevant to Indian country? And that started this idea of an externship. And so, um, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium was part of those discussions and adopted the early model for what an externship would be. And uh, um, it turned into pretty much three weeks on a center, followed by seven weeks at home working on a research project. Um, still a learning process. There were a lot of bugs that needed to be worked out. Some of the students, even though it was three weeks, it was still a long time to be away from home. Um, and especially in a foreign, on a different planet like DC. <clears throat> So as that evolution occurred in that NASA-specific um, re research experience, um, 
it turned into a true externship where students don't step foot on a NASA center. They spent three weeks in immersive training at a tribal college learning all of the same tricks that they would had they been at Goddard, the GIS or remote sensing, those kinds of things. It was still very much an immersion. And they developed their research projects while they were there working on those tribal colleges. And then they would return home with their own research that leveraged NASA assets, satellite data, uh, MODIS data, Landsat continuity mission data, and so on, to use those tools for their, for their research. And the research projects became their own. You know, some Navajo students would talk about the importance of ants. Uh, some talked about uh, sand dune migrations on Navajo. Um, <clears throat> Uh, deforestation and forestation in the Turtle Mountains, for example. You know, how is those transitioning? Okay, these is when the tribal college students really started to say, these are important questions to me. Now I want to learn how to use these tools so that I can apply it to answer these questions. And so it became my task then to uh, teach the GIS, to teach the remote sensing, to help these students develop their own individual research projects and then guide them both through content and technology to that point where they can produce a PowerPoint and not a UG PowerPoint, but a real PowerPoint, a different PowerPoint. <clears throat> um, and also poster presentations, things that they could be proud of. And so over time that, and then something interesting happened in, uh, um, that about two years ago when President Obama was elected, uh, all the appropriations went away, including the appropriation that went to AHEC uh, to do these NASA internships. And so they came up for uh, basically public comp competition, which meant that everybody in the country had the opportunity to compete for those teacup funds. And uh, so we ran the real risk of seeing tribal college specific programs being taken on by uh, uh, United Negro College Fund or uh, Dartmouth, you know, Dartmouth, places like that. And these were tribal college specific programs. And, uh, or you know, even some of the historically black colleges were going to be able to throw their hat in the ring for that. And fortunately, we pulled together a partnership. We submitted a successful application uh, to continue that research model, but to even take it a step further. So not only does that tribal college partnership that includes White Earth, includes Haskell, includes Tanahatam, um, but it also includes opportunities for all the tribal college students from across the country. From Barrow, last year we had a, a student from Barrow, Alaska, from Ilasabit. They came down and participated. Students from Northwest Indian, from, from Menominee, uh, from Diné College, from uh, Navajo Tech, um, you know, SKC. Uh, there were students that applied from Blackfeet and all over. Okay, so um, we were able to continue with that externship model, um, bringing together teams of scientists. In this case, it was at Haskell Indian Nations, scientists from UCAR, scientists from USGS, scientists from NASA, scientists from private sector to mentor the GIS, to mentor the climate change uh, and vulnerability risk assessment training and what that means, and mentor the remote sensing and to mentor the research project content. And it didn't stop after that three-week immersion. <clears throat> These students have to develop their own research plan and then follow it through. When they go home, they go with copies of ARC-10 in hand because one of the limitations was great. They would go to Goddard or they would go to these training sessions and be exposed to all this wonderful technology and then they go home and the doors are closed for the summer. They don't have access to labs. They can't do the GIS. They can't fulfill their project act activities. How do we overcome that? And that's problem solving. So what do you do? You pick up the phone, you call Esri, you talk to Esther Worker, who's the tribal college rep at Esri, and say, Esther, we need some uh, evaluation site licenses for our 10. And I need them free of charge, and this is where they're going. And she says, okay, let me know where you need them and when. And that's how it works. And so every one of the students and their faculty, because faculty participate in this too, it's not just students. Last year we had 20 students and 10 faculty that participated. Um, every one of those go home with the technology in hand so that they can continue. Every one of those 
participants have GIS remote sensing specialists in email or phone call away, almost 24-7. Um, the faculty, that the instructors that teach during that, uh, one is the uh, GIS coordinator from the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde in Oregon. His name is Volker Mal, a not so big German anymore. He used to be a very big German. But uh, he spent some time up here in, at working on, on Flathead, working for the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribe. Is that right, Bill? Yeah, he taught GIS course also for the Yeah, and he taught GIS at SKC. Our instructor going into this year uh, includes Volker, but also Rob Kenny is going to be one of our instructors too, uh, teaching at GIS. And so we're drawing from that tribal college expertise to not only instruct, but also serve as mentors. Plus, we still have scientists from UCAR that are standing by the phone. We have scientists from uh, USGS. Uh, we have the, uh, the Central Region Tribal Liaison, who's part of this team and is, and is mentoring students. Okay, so we really emphasize this mentoring role from a science content perspective, but also from a technology perspective. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said something. No. <clears throat> Uh, the voices in my head are speaking, <laughs> and they sound like Ed. <laughs> we, you can wrap it up. I'm just afraid that little baby's going to grow out of its. Uh, <laughs> 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 you, have to, you have to start beating now. <laughs> All right. So anyhow, um, cut into the chase. And the thing that's really different with this effort now is NASA is investing. Uh, not just in the summer REU, but they're investing in academic REUs that are focused on tribal campuses, tribal college campuses, to buy out faculty time to do research, to pay for students to engage in research, to pay for graduate students to come to the campus and backfill a teaching load, um, travel budgets, and other things. And I'm happy to say that Michael's been um, a good partner in that process as well. So it's those kind of, I'm not the kind of PI that just, I'm not a general that way. During those, uh, those training sessions, uh, part of that mentoring is on me. And so part of the instruction during those times is on me, and as well as the team that we put together. Uh, when the students go home, part of that mentoring, there's a, uh, we split them up among all the mentors. And so I have four students that I'm responsible for during that time. And they know that if they have problems they need to call me and so I'm still very much engaged in that mentoring process and that's if from my perspective we've had success and I think that's the kind of commitment it takes uh, kind of mentoring commitment it takes from our science faculty uh, not just at tribal colleges but our science faculty that uh, would mentor from the University of Montana as well so great <clears throat> Yeah, take that away. One last, there's a question over there, but you can have a conversation with Bull if you want to. But Michael Price, you come forward, please. I don't know this story this well. There's a voice whisper in my ear. I understand you had a challenge ahead of you. No. All right, today? No. But it's coming. Yeah. And I want, to, I want to present you with a little gift. I don't know if you were here to see these moccasins and how they're separated or not. I did. But these are for you, they're not separated. If you want to give one to your chairman of your committee and say it takes two to be together, you can, you can share that, that, that story. But my, my message to you is keep going. Don't give up. That's right. We all need you. So I just wanted to say that. Congratulations and keep on your path. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to uh, be a little bit rude and wrap this up so some of our colleagues can, can get to their families. But if you want to chat with Bull, Please do. He has plenty of good chat and left in him. I almost bet. So, so don't feel don't feel bad about that. But I thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for being here and coming and listening and engaging. That's what it's all about. So thank you. Thank you again and good night.